Okay, uh, for those of you who have been, uh, who are paying attention to the uh, talks th today, you'll notice that the title of my talk and the title of Peter Shor's talk this morning are essentially the same module, a uh, uh, little rotation in the words or so. Um, so I promise I will adapt my talk uh, to fill in the spaces that were skipped over by Peter. Um, I'd also like to thank those of you who've stuck around to the bitter end so that I have an audience. Um, what I am, uh, just to reiterate the picture that Peter showed of this, this standard uh, uh, block diagram of uh, quantum error correction. We have, you know, we protect our information with an encoder. It goes through some noisy channel, and then we have the recovery operation afterwards. And uh, what we've been talking about, and what he introduced well, is the fact that rather than simply making a generic assumption about the channel and its behavior, and choosing our encoding operation, recovery operation accordingly, we can in fact use mathematical optimization procedures to compute uh, efficient and, and in fact in terms of intent entanglement fidelity optimal things to do. Uh, I will be focusing most of my talk uh, on the idea of doing optimal recovery, fixing an encoding and then uh, and calculating the recovery. But as was pointed out both by Peter and by, by Robert uh, Kosut on Wednesday, you can uh, fix the recovery and, and optimize the encoding and therefore get an iterative procedure. So really what we're, what we're working on is an optimization problem of maximizing overall choices of the recovery operation R of some entanglement fidelity. So uh, Peter went through this, and I'm going to skip. I'm going to move through it very quickly. In fact, I might as well just put it all on the on the screen. Just to remind, uh, what we need to do, what our valid choices of recovery operation are something that's completely positive trace preserving, uh, which we know we can represent with the Krauss uh, operators, but that's an inconvenient form to use for optimization because it's a, uh, there are many to one representations of uh, Krauss operators to the mapping. So it's easier to use the super operator, uh, excuse me, the, the Jamielkowski isomorphism to create what is often referred to as a Choi matrix representation so that you get a, an operator X that represents in a one-to-one -one sense the way that the channel behaves. And this is constrained to be a semi-definite matrix, so this is a matrix uh, inequality, as well as an, uh, an equality constraint that uh, is exactly equivalent to the trace preserving line up here. Um, and as was pointed out again, entanglement fidelity has this nice quadratic form in, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the Choi matrix, which uh, makes it very clearly linear. So uh, th this breaks down into three pieces that make it very clear to see as a semi-definite program. You're maximizing some uh, linear uh, trace of x times c, where c represents the, the encoding, the channel dynamics, and the input state, uh, which gives us a linear objective function. We've got a linear equality constraint and a semi-definite constraint. So this is what Peter went through in much more detail, and I'm going to move right past it. And he also talked about this, this picture, but just to remind you, we're this is an example using the amplitude damping channel where gamma is the probability of, of uh, 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 losing a photon of energy, if you will, if going from the one state to the zero state. Um, the blue curve here represents the five qubit code's performance in terms of entanglement fidelity when you do the standard stabilizer measurement um, and, uh, and recover accordingly, whereas the red, here uh, is what you could do optimally. Now, there's been a couple of references already today to the four qubit code from Leung and collaborators. Um, I just wanted to point out just how well matched that code is in its performance and entanglement fidelity to the uh, performance of the five qubit code. In the paper, when it was originally proposed, there was a recovery operation that's given here by the light blue line that directly tracks the five qubit code uh, performance for the stabilizer measurements. And in fact, by doing an optimal recovery, it then tracks the uh, performance that you see with the optimal five qubit code. Okay, so that's what you've seen already. I'd like and. and and uh, Peter this morning made some reference to the approximate structured, more heuristic uh, approaches of getting a lower bound uh, in, a, in a more numerical way. So I really want to motivate this by talking about looking for a structured recovery operation that is nearly optimal. And the reason why this is this is a value, despite the fact that I've just shown you how to calculate the optimal, is both because of the structure that it implies and also to be able to not scale computation quite as badly. Uh, it's 
pointed out that it's still going to have to scale computation, uh, scale exponentially because the dimension of the problem as you uh, get longer, and lo uh, look at longer and longer codes, does the dimension of that problem scales exponentially. But the semi-definite program optimizes for an N1 code, four to the N plus one optimization variables, which gets out of hand quite quickly. Um, furthermore, the, the operation that comes out optimally is one that uh, is very difficult to interpret to understand exactly what's actually going on, what the behavior is that we're exploiting, as well as the fact that it doesn't have any particular structure that you might be able to exploit to do some implementation. Uh, and so you can think about it as truly the best that you could do, but not necessarily what you would exactly try to do. So in order to impose the structure, what, I would, what seems an intuitive thing to do is to require us to start with a projective measurement operator, to start with a syndrome measurement that's very similar to what you would do in the more generic uh, quantum error correction. We'd make some measurements that would provide a, 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 a syndrome, and these would not be generic measurements, but be projective measurements. Um, by doing that, um, we can reduce the problem to picking out the measurement operator, the, the, the subspaces onto which we're going to project, and then uh, from there it's actually very straightforward to determine the prop, uh, appropriate correction term. So uh, I'd like to point out that you can use eigen analysis to simplify the problem quite a bit uh, once you've made this uh, move to a structured projective syndrome measurement. And the reason why this is so is following. What we're looking for are recovery operators that have the form of a, project, a syndrome projection and then a rotation back into the code space, um, which leads to, if we once again look at the isomorphism, look at these as vectors as opposed to uh, operators, we have this orthonormality, which just means that we're projecting onto orthogonal subspaces. Well, if we were to pretend that this constraint that I've written here is the only constraint on the problem, then the maximization that we're looking at here is maximizing over some set of vectors to try to uh, maximize this quadratic form, where C, remember, is the uh, information about the channel that we're, that we're looking at. Well, that's actually an eigenvalue problem. If we, if we wanted to specify a certain number of R sub K to choose, and we wanted to get, uh, and that were our only constraint, we would simply choose the eigenvectors associated with the N largest, whatever N we would choose, uh, eigenvalues of the matrix C. Well, it turns out the completely positive trace preserving constraint is a little bit different from that one, but we can fake it. We can finesse it just a little bit to make it really close. Um, and, and, and the reason for that is because the, nearly optimal, the, the optimal solution is very nearly a projective measurement, especially for low noise values in the cases that we've looked at. So I've called this EigenQER for Eigen Quantum Error Recovery, but really what this is doing is providing some structure and also some, uh, a, a little bit better computational scaling. So just to talk about how this works, you start with a data matrix, and, and, and this actually is very uh, reminiscent of what was discussed two talks ago. Uh, it's not exactly the same as that Gram-Schmidt procedure, but you can think of it very similarly. We have our data matrix C, and what we want to do is find the recovery operator that begins with a projection operation that uh, provides the most fidelity. Um, and so what we do is we find the eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue. And from there, it's not, this x sub k is not going to be in the form we want of a projection followed by a rotation. But using actually the singular value decomposition, we can move it to there, uh, find the, the uh, operator of this form that is closest to it in terms of the Frobenius norm. Um, and once you have that, we've now determined what the proper subspace is. So the next step is to project that out of our data matrix so that we don't, uh, so that we wind up with orthogonal subspaces that we're looking at. And when this is done, we iterate until we've filled up our operation, until we have a complete, uh, a complete operation. Um, so the question is, I've said this is nearly optimal, how well does it do? Well, for the example that I've already seen, blue here, the solid blue line is the optimal, and the solid red line is now this, near, this structured near optimal. And you can see, especially as gamma goes to zero, they become indistinguishable. Um, that uh, this suggests that uh, we are, and I apologize, these somehow my gammas have turned to Gs while I wasn't looking. Um, the, uh, and, and so we see that this actually approximates the performance. But since we could, in this case, calculate the optimal, uh, it's, not, it, it, it's not quite so interesting except to observe the behavior. But because this 
problem scales computationally a lot better, we can look at a, a picture that, I get, that Peter once again showed this morning, but I'll talk about again, for the five cubic code, the seven cubic code, and the nine cubic code. Uh, because now these are more tractable computationally, where it was a semi-definite program, they're a lot harder to, to actually get all the way through. So I want to point out the dotted behavior here is what happens if you do the standard uh, stabilizer recovery of simply measuring each stabilizer and doing the minimum weight recovery operation. And you can see that the longer the code, the worse the behavior, which at first might seem a little bit strange, but it's actually not very hard to see because we think about those codes are designed to correct for an arbitrary single qubit error. And for a fixed gamma, the probability of any one qubit being uh, uh, the, f at a longer code, we have more probability that any one of those errors, is going to, any one of those qubits is going to be an error. But you could also turn that around and think intuitively, we've got a longer code, we only have, we're only encoding one qubit of information. There's more redundancy, we ought to be able to protect it better. And certainly that's the case that we can see, especially with the behavior that, that Peter pointed out this morning of the nine qubit code getting all of the uh, uh, correct even second order behavior, um, and that that's true. Interestingly enough, it's not, a, uh, we still have some codes better adapted to channels than others, as we see that the five qubit code optimally still behaves better, uh, still performs better than the seven qubit code uh, optimally. So Peter showed this slide, I won't say much about it, but uh, uh, the, th my claim that these are nearly optimal uh, is backed up with, some, uh, with an algorithm using the dual function to upper bound the performance as well. And you can see that especially in the case of the uh, nine qubit code, the, uh, the structured near, near optimal is as near optimal as, as the resolution of this picture anyway. Uh, before I move on and talk a little bit about, I want to give a, a few more interpretations of uh, how this is, how we're getting this extra performance in the amplitude damping channel, a little bit beyond or in a different tack than what Peter said this morning. But I do want to point out that everything that I've mentioned so far, as far as numerical techniques, despite using examples of the amplitude damping channel, it's important to note that these are completely general algorithms that can be used with any. Uh, 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 with any channel model, uh, presuming that they start in the, uh, the system of bath start in an unentangled state. So the picture that I like to use, the cartoon really, to, to show the discretization of errors that you see in quantum error correction, uh, just to, we all know this, and so I, I can move on uh, just pointing out that when we take those syndrome measurements, we discretize what are superpositions of errors into their relevant subspaces. Um, in the case of the amplitude damping channel, the, the main source of error, the, this damping term, is in fact an X plus IY, as Peter talked about before. And so when we are correcting it in the standard stabilizer way, we're using up two of our syndrome degrees of freedom for every one error. Um, and so it makes sense to think about uh, projecting directly into the, syndrome, into the subspace of those uh, dominant error terms. And that's really what's going on um, in, all of, in, in the examples that we've observed. So back to the four qubit code, and once again, Peter talked about this so I can be very fa uh, fast and moving about it. These are the zero and, and one logical code words, and we can see that a damping uh, error occurring on any one of these qubits pushes us into mutually orthogonal subspaces and yet maintains the superposition. Furthermore, we can see that there are some subspaces that will only be reached when two qubits are damped. Unfortunately, they're only reached when two qubits, in this case, they're only reached when two qubits are damped and we were in the logical zero. Uh, and so this has destroyed the superposition but has still provided some, uh, some information which, we can, uh, which can be recovered. Um, in fact, uh, oh, excuse me, um, I want to talk about how to generalize this code within a stabilizer for, uh, formulation because this is a stabilizer code and, I, and I'll talk, talk that through. But in order to do that, I want to take a minute and just tell you how it is that an uh, amplitude damping error of the form X plus IY uh, occurs, uh, how this perturbs a stabilizer subspace. If we have a stabilizer, uh, a subspace that's stabilized by G and we have an X plus IY operator that, that occurs on that state, then if 
G commutes with both X and Y, which would mean that there's an I on, that there's the identity on the ith qubit, then that, then G continues to be a stabilizer of the new state. If in fact, it anti-commutes with both X, uh, X and Y on the ith qubit, which would mean there's Z on that qubit, then, it, then minus G is now a stabilizer of the state. So far this is, comes as no real surprise. Uh, actually, none of this should be a surprise. Um, that if, in fact, it commutes with x and anti-commutes with y or vice versa, which means that there's an x or a y on that qubit, then in fact, g is no longer a stabilizer of the state. But we know, after the amplitude damping has happened, that z on the ith qubit will, in fact, be a stabilizer of that state. So what that means is that we can look at the, the same 4-1 code before as a stabilizer code and understand what happens with each of the, with the errors on each of these uh, subspaces. So if we perform a damping on the first subspace, it, uh, this, uh, this stabilizer goes away, this one becomes negative, and this one stays the same, and then we add a z on the first qubit. We can look at the same thing on the second, third, and fourth qubits, and we get these four, these four subspaces. Uh, we can see, for example, that they're all orthogonal to the uh, main subspace because we have a minus ZZII and a plus ZZII, and, and the same thing over here. Um, we can also see pretty quickly that these are orthogonal to each other. And if we simply do a rewriting uh, by, uh, of the, uh, the second and the fourth subspaces, we can see that all four of these are in fact mutually orthogonal. Uh, this also gives us a clue as to how to perform the recovery operation. We, me we can start simply by measuring uh, in the standard stabilizer form, ZZII and then IIZZ. If they both come out to be plus one, then we can conclude that neither of the qubits was damped, um, or the possibility, I suppose, that two were damped, but that's clearly a less likely scenario, in which case we have two choices. We can measure the, the all x stabilizer, or we can do something to, to further minimize the, uh, 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 the distortion caused in that case. Peter talked a little bit about the fact that uh, you will get some uh, distortion that we've been ignoring so far in this analysis. And so you can either do a stabilizer measurement or a gamma dependent measurement if you feel like you have a good estimate for what gamma really is. At that point, if we get a minus one on one of these two things, uh, for example, we get a minus one on the first, we can then measure z on the first qubit, and if it becomes plus one, we know the first qubit was damped, and if it becomes a minus one, we know the second qubit was damped. And in that way, we can then uh, apply a, a Pauli x to that one and measure the all x stabilizer, and that is our recovery operation. So, uh, oh, I, I should mention that, well, I haven't talked about it on this slide. Remember, I told you there were certain subspaces we could only reach by multiple qubit dampings, and you can see that also through this analysis of the stabilizers. Well, it's not hard to see that you can quickly generalize these codes uh, to longer length multiple qubit, uh, multiple logical qubit codes simply by adding an extra pair of uh, qubits that have the same phase, that have z on them. Um, so in this case, I've, I've shown you the 6.2 and the 8.3 code, and in fact, we can have a, pre, a, a, a straightforward understanding of how the recovery operation for these is going to work as well by simply measuring each of these z-pair stabilizers to determine uh, whether there were any dampings that occurred. At that point, determining which of the twos have been known for, for a number of years, but they haven't necessarily, I haven't seen uh, much evidence of them in the literature, so it's, it's worth putting them out there. Um, to look at the performance of these codes in terms of the amplitude damping errors, um, I wanted to compare, for example, the 6.2 and the 4.1 code, and to put them on an equal footing, I repeated the 4.1 code twice, and so now this black dotted line refers to putting two qubits through, uh, 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 through, through the channel on encoded, as compared to the 4.1 and the 6.2 code, and you can see that they actually have very equivalent performance in that sense, which is kind of interesting, because we know that the 4.1 code repeated twice, has quite a few multiple dampings that, you, it, could, that it could correct, as long as they happened on, on the separate blocks. Whereas the 6.2 code can't correct fully for multiple dampings. But however, it does have some, that it, uh, it's shortened the code, and so the chances of having any one qubit uh, damped are lower. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, of having multiple dampings because there are six qubits as opposed to eight, that chance is lower, as well as the fact that it can partially correct for multiple qubit dampings. Well, if we look at the, uh, uh, the performance for 
six two eight three ten four. They track each other surprisingly well. Well, just before I conclude, I just want to mention that there's one other way that you could go about using a stabilizer code to correct this. This has also been known before, but since we're looking for X and Y errors, we could simply do any kind of classical linear code, in, in, this, in this case the Hammond code, uh, that, uh, to determine whether an X or a Y error occurred, and then do the all X uh, stabilizer in order to determine whether it was an X or a Y. So th the reason why the Steen code didn't perform so well, the, the seven qubit code before, is because that all of the different X's stabilizers were of less value because you get most of that back when you do it just in this one case here. Now, interestingly enough, the 7.3 and the 8.3 in the other cases have very similar performance despite the fact that the 8.3 can partially correct for extra errors and the, the, the I'm sorry, the 8.3 can and the 7.3 cannot, but they do track each other fairly well here. Well, just to conclude, I wanted to point out the, the uh, the, wor the work that's been done here is both a fact, the, the semi-definite program structure of the, the talk, uh, of the of this problem of optimal recovery and also optimal encoding, uh, but the fact that we've provided now structured near-optimal recovery operations uh, as well as upper bounds for their optimality. And then we've talked a little bit about how it is that we can understand amplitude dampened codes in terms of the uh, stabilizer states. Thank you very much. We've seen quite a bit of discussion about the different uh, Hamiltonian models. Um, rather than thinking, uh, uh, so the short answer truly is no. That I'm not. I, I don't usually think about it in, the, in those terms. I, I've spent most of my time starting with different models for how this behaves. Um, however, you know, when we've talked about uh, one of the assumptions that goes into this is that we have a completely positive map, and we've heard some talks today, uh, not today actually, this, during this conference about non-completely positive error, uh, error terms, and I believe actually that um, if you were going to constrain yourself to recover with a, complete, a completely positive map, then you could cast this as the same, uh, the same type of convex optimization problem, perhaps with some questions about whether, about whether it converges. I know that's not quite the question that you asked, but uh, I answer one that I knew what to say about. Yeah, um, so I guess you could think of the uh, A split channel that uh, I don't know. Right. You could think of those as a, as a sort of, you know, kind of channel to adapt to that. Um, I guess uh, two questions. One, um, how would you do? And two, uh, they spend a lot of time trying Right. Um, right. That's Absolutely. That's well, first, uh, yeah, okay, so the, the answer to the first part of that question, and the first question, is that since the phase flip is, in fact, uh, you know, this is a Pauli operation, um, the, Peter mentioned in his talk the fact that mixtures of Pauli operations, uh, uh, channels that which are mixtures of Pauli operations uh, rather than the amplitude damping which is superposition of Pauli operations are actually much easier to un to uh, essentially without doing an optimization procedure guess the answer if we have a stabilizer code and we have a mixture of Pauli's channel, then doing the stabilizer recovery and then whatever the maximum likelihood uh, 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 choices of then syndrome recoveries is in fact the right thing to do. Um, and so that you could understand, for example, the phase flip channel uh, without having to go necessarily to all of the optimization procedures, but rather thinking about it uh, um, otherwise. Um, as to your second question, uh, this, uh, the work that's presented here is all talking about the, the nice benign communications paradigm of uh, you're trying to just move 
quantum information from one side to the other. It's, it hasn't, we haven't, I didn't address in this talk uh, fault tolerance. Um, and certainly it will be an issue as to making sure that by adapting to this non-generic choice of channels that you need your operators to not propagate the information in such a way as to, to destroy our nice clean recoveries. Um, and it is an issue. Um, it's something that would have to come up. Um, one of the things that perhaps uh, would work a little bit, uh, that would work well is if uh, there's the, the whole talk about whether the damping errors might be a result of simply the time elapsed as opposed to uh, operations that you're doing, in which case you could always begin any operation by uh, uh, doing this amplitude damping error correction, uh, presuming that that's not going to introduce more dampings, but perhaps introduce other kinds of noise, and then that would be the first level of concatenation. But it's absolutely an issue. Since the, the chair has